In this video, I will tell you about the birth and development of gasifier transport in the Soviet Union, firewood-powered Soviet trucks, tractors, boats, and trains. I will also tell you about the first enthusiasts, scientists, and engineers of the gasifier business. World War I and the October Revolution had already raged, and the Civil War, which took 17 million lives, was over. Two million people fled the country. And a new country began to emerge in the ashes. The vast territory of the now former Russian Empire required an incredible amount of transport and fuel for it. At that time, all of Europe already drove cars and trucks, and 23 years before, in 1900, the first firewood-powered vehicle had appeared there. In the USSR, everything was just beginning. The young state, built on the ruins of the old world, needed to survive. And when everything in the economy was not just bad, but very bad, the transport gasifier came onto the scene. In 1923, a patent for AU-1 transport gasifier was filed for the first time in Soviet history. It was filed by Professor Namov from Leningrad. The U stands for Yugol, which means charcoal. The device could also run on coal and coke. In Leningrad, a city located far away from oil fields, the first known Soviet transport gasifier appeared, though only on paper so far. The operation principle of the first gasifier was similar to that of the blast furnace, the ancestor of all gasifiers. Namov's device was a hopper line from the inside. Steam was fed into it allowing to replace part of the fuel with water. The steam supply itself caused problems. If too much steam was supplied, the temperature dropped and, consequently, the gas deteriorated in quality. Water got into the engine. If there was too little steam, power dropped. Sometimes pieces of charcoal were of different sizes, creating voids in which the steam did not decompose, but flew on. It was difficult to control the amount of steam supplied when the water began to boil. For this reason, both European and Soviet inventors tried to make charcoal gasifiers without a water supply. Although Professor Namov had patented his first U-1 gasifier in 1923, he got the possibility to make and test it only four years after the patent was obtained. At that time, in 1927, only laboratory tests were conducted. Another year later, in 1928, he got a chance to test the gasifier on the road during a motor rally. It was already the second, improved version of the U-2 gasifier. The motor rally was held by the Avtador Voluntary Society. Its task was to popularize the introduction of automobiles in the USSR, the country where motor cars had not yet been produced. The Avtador Society was organized in 1927. It conducted the first ever Soviet automobile rally of two charcoal-powered trucks in collaboration with Professor Namov a year later, in 1928. One truck was Soviet-assembled, and the other was purchased abroad, in Somua, with a Rex gasifier. In 1932, Avtador would already have one million members. A written-off Fiat truck was found for the professor to take part in the rally. Makovetsky, Namov's loyal assistant, was restoring that truck as best as he could. It was a wreck being restored using whatever was available. Namov's gasifier weighed 285 kilograms. Barely, by some miracle, the companions managed to get it all to work, and the truck went on its first rally. It used about half a kilogram of charcoal per kilometer. On the way, the wheels almost fell off, and wet charcoal was given instead of dry as fuel. It's hard to look at this whole situation today without tears. That's how it was the first Soviet gasifier truck and motor rally. And, honestly, if it were not for the handyman Makovetsky, who restored the truck and repaired the crumbling car on the move, it was unlikely that anything would have been possible to check. The rally finished, the truck had driven 1,310 kilometers from Leningrad to Moscow and back to Leningrad. The rally neither attracted any interest nor gave an impetus to the development of the firewood-powered automobile industry. A one-and-a-half-ton Fiat truck was able to drive a considerable distance on charcoal, albeit wet. The professor went down in history as the first Soviet enthusiast to build a transport gasifier. Charcoal was used in motor rallies both in Europe and in the USSR. 
To put it simply, the professors from the Aftador Voluntary Society made everything themselves at their own expense. They enjoyed the event, and that was it. After the motor rally, Namov's gasifier was mothballed for several years. The lack of support did not stop Namov, and he made two more units, U3 and U4, for the Kaminar tractor. The projects were transferred to the Kharkov steam locomotive plant, where one model was in production for three years. I believe Namov financed everything at his own expense. In 1931, the U-2 gasifier, which made the first gasified motor rally in Soviet history, was installed on a Ford truck. It went on its second 1,212 km long motor rally from Leningrad to Petrozavodsk. Then it went to work in Karelia. After seeing the gasifier truck, the Karelian base wanted 50 Namov gasifiers for tractors and trucks. But after the estimation they realized had no money. Nobody knows how long the Kharkov steam locomotive plant would have been inventing a tractor gasifier if the Aftador Society, which was searching for a gasifier model for trucks and tractors, had not given Namov a cash prize for the U3 and U4 gasifiers in 1931. By the way, nine projects, including by other Soviet inventors, participated in the Aftador competition. We will talk about these inventors later. Bonusing the professor with ready cash helped him finish the U-4 gasifier and put it on a tractor in the same year of 1931. The tractor engine had a 4.35 compression ratio. In 1932, this tractor participated in a competition organized by Aftador along with three other tractors. It was driven for 20 hours with a load and then idled for a day. In the photo, the letter A marks the gasifier, B purifier, and D two charcoal boxes for six hours of operation. The letter M marks the gas pipe to the engine. The tests were successful. In the same year, the professor made a U5 gasifier model for gas trucks and NAU6 gasifier, running on firewood or lignite, for motorboats with a HTZ tractor engines. It was a downdraft gasifier. The NAU-6 was tested during a 300 km long boat rally on the Neva River. The results were satisfactory. The U-5 model was specially designed for a truck to participate in a new motor rally. In 1933, the gas truck with a 5.4 compression ratio and equipped with the U-5 gasifier performed amazingly during the 2,928 km and 166 hours and 7 minutes long, Leningrad, Moscow, Kharkov, Rostov, or Janikidze. Tiflis motor rally without a single breakdown or stop due to gasifier fault. This motor rally played a great propaganda role in the introduction of gasifier transport. After the rally, the gas truck with the U5 unit delivered cargo in Leningrad and its suburbs daily for a year. It was the first time when a Soviet gasifier vehicle operated in real conditions for so long. During the year of its real operation, it traveled 9,216 kilometers. The gasifier worked 882 hours and 45 minutes, and, if we include the Leningrad Tiflis motor rally, then we get 12,154 kilometers and 1,003 hours 30 minutes long run. The same model, but with minor changes, participated in the Moscow Leningrad motor rally. U5 truck gasifier was the quintessence of the professor's experience. It was the best Soviet charcoal gasifier of those years. U6, the last charcoal gasifier using a direct process, like an ancient blast furnace, was made as an industrial model. And on June 11, 1935, it was tested on the Pesikneya Siverskaya Pesikneya 170 km long route. This gasifier was tested on a truck with a trailer loaded with 2.5 tons of iron and six passengers on board. Together it made 3.1 tons, including the weight of the gasifier. The truck overcame the whole route and managed to reach a speed of 45 km per hour. In 1939, the professor designed two anthracite gasifiers, UA-8 and UA-9. Experience showed that an anthracite gasifier took much longer to start up than a charcoal device because of the low hard coal reactivity and its high ignition temperature of 700 to 800 degrees. It was impossible to gasify hard coal without adding water. The gas had very low caloric content, 775 to 975 kilocalories, even with water fed into the 300 mm thick combustion layer with a burning intensity of 120 kg per square meter. Anthracite has a low ash melting temperature of 1150 to 1250 degrees against 1400 of wood. 
This caused the slack to clog the grates even with the water supply. The professor had to invent a rotating knife grid which solved the problem. State tests showed a number of disadvantages, that is the truck was unable to operate under variable load. Moreover, there was no controllable water supply. It was fed in a strictly defined amount comprising 30% of the fuel mass. The professor would have supplied even more water, but it was an old model, taken off the charcoal gasifier. The gasifier had a low-performance gas purifier made of iron shavings and a cloth back. This work was conducted on the eve of World War II, in 1939-1940. Later, neither during the war nor after it, nothing about the professor was mentioned in the literature. His last article about anthracite gasifiers is dated February 2, 1940. Considering that he lived in Leningrad and what became of the city during its blockade, and he was already an elderly man, I assume that he died of starvation during the blockade. The professor made a whole series of charcoal gasifiers and planned to quickly make a downdraft firewood gasifier as he made one for a motorboat, but he didn't succeed. Even Imbert, supported by the French government, spent 13 years to build a successful firewood gasifier. Such a development was just a dream in the USSR because it should have relied only on enthusiasm with meter funds and no government assistance. The professor worked on gasifiers in Leningrad, in the so-called Leningrad school, which tended to use charcoal. And the so-called Moscow school tended to use wood. The Avtador Society was the first organization to popularize gasifiers in the USSR and to push the idea of introducing solid fuel vehicles. Avtador had started with Namov and a small group of people, but in a couple of years, it consisted of 28 million members. Naturally, those years demonstrated a feeble effort, since the USSR did not yet produce its own automobiles. In 1928, there were only 10 petrol stations in the whole country, eight of which operated in Moscow and Leningrad. The whole country moved around on horses. There were about 28 million working horses. Things were about to change a lot. From 1923, the time he patented his first gasifier in the ranks of the Avtador Society, Professor Namov undertook tireless awareness and design efforts in the field of gasifiers. He advocated a lot for gasifier trucks and tractors and created a core of gasifier designers. He was and remained a staunch charcoal advocate insisting on the use of charcoal for transport gasifiers. The professor gave an impetus to Soviet designers. In 1925, another outstanding Soviet scientist and engineer, Professor Karpov, began working on the gasifier topic. From 1927 to 1933, he worked on charcoal gasifiers at the Military Academy of Mechanization and Motorization of the Red Army. Several good quality and comprehensible books came from under his pen. In 1930, in one of his books, he laid the foundation for experiments on heavy hydrocarbon injection. In fact, more than half of the fuel was replaced by fuel oil. After the war, the work he started would be brought to fruition. I will tell you about it later. His charcoal gasifier units were installed on trucks of the Gorky and Yaroslavl plants, as well as on several tractors. A distinctive feature of Karpov's automobile gasifier units was a twin gasifier consisting of two cylindrical reactors. Two representatives of the first wave of gasifier engineers began their works on charcoal gasifiers, Mikhailovsky, who worked at the Central Research Institute of Mechanizing and Powering the Forest Industry, in 1935, and Validin from the Leningrad Industrial Institute in 1935 to 1936. Namov himself was a staunch supporter of charcoal gasifiers. In the 1930s, he had already had a chance to see foreign firewood gasifiers, including Imbert ones. In his opinion, they were too delicate and required fuel with 15 to 20 percent moisture content, which was impossible to reach in the city of Leningrad and the northern forests where the professor lived. Damp weather and a few sunny days made it impossible to dry the wood. In addition, the wood had to be cut into billets small cubes the size of a matchbox or slightly larger. We remember that everything was just developing in those days, and no wood chopping equipment was locally available. Besides, firewood dryers were also needed. By the way, until the beginning of World War II, the USSR had never been able to solve the problem of drying billets for automobiles. Meanwhile according to Namov, burning charcoal was easier. Besides, it could be made from different wood, twigs, laths, and other things. While billets had to be made only from good wood. Another Soviet titan of firewood transport gasifiers, a craftsman from the north of the country, the driver of the Moscow School of Transport Firewood Gasifiers, disagreed with him. In 
inventor Dekalenkov can be safely called the first Soviet gasifier engineer, just like Professor Namov. While Namov represented the charcoal school of gasifiers in Leningrad, Dekalenkov represented the firewood school of Soviet gasifiers located in Moscow. Dekalenkov built several gasifiers in Volodya province to generate electricity from firewood as early as 1918 to 1923. He used old tractor engines for the stations. He began dealing with gasifiers for electricity in the villages, where splinters were used to light the huts in those days. The whole country was dreary and medieval, with carriages and horses. Dekalenkov began electrification two years before the USSR master plan. By the way, he was the first to suggest turning old engines into firewood power generation stations in the villages. The first engines he got were trophy ones, obtained from the interventionists or removed from abandoned World War I tractors. He made brick gasifiers to generate electricity. I managed to find one of his first advertising booklets at the time, a good example of a 1924 advertisement. It also shows his stationary gasifier. Libraries were literally flooded with his booklets. They were everywhere. By the number of booklets and libraries and book references, he can be safely called the most active gasifier engineer of the first wave of inventors. Next, I will tell you how he was able to practically make a firebox better than Imbert's. In the meantime, in 1929, Dekalenkov made the first metal gasifier. The inventor named it Orbless. Two years later the gasifier was tested at Automotive Research Institute, but the results were unsatisfactory. Around the same time, in 1930-1931, engineer Videnski and engineer Zhukov from the Agricultural Mechanics Institute designed gasifiers for communar and international tractors. These were the first Soviet tractors and the first Soviet gasifiers, everything was made by the Soviet people themselves. Zhukov's SCH-2 gasifier was mounted on an international tractor, which left the Stalingrad tractor plant assembly line. The tests and first difficulties began. According to the idea, the gasifier could run on wood billets, charcoal, coke, cotton waste, and dry peat. Videnski's V3 gasifier was put on a communar tractor donated by the Kharkov locomotive plant on which it was made. The tractor was tested on timber hauling and cargo transportation. Two tractors factories had started their production. Mass production of gasifier tractors would begin soon. Так мы встречали трактор Путиловского завода номер 34001. Первый трактор Харьковского завода, начало создания многотысячного парка сельскохозяйственных машин. Мечта о стотысячном скоро говорил на торжествах первого Харьковского трактора всеукраинский староста Григорий Иванович Петровский. «Будут у нас и миллионы», — уверенно сказал тогда товарищ Кассиор, секретарь ЦК Коммунистической партии Украины. Engineer Videnski has written several very informative and comprehensible books about gasifiers. If you begin to study this topic, I would advise you to start with them. At that time, in 1928, at the Wood Institute, Professor Vechinkin was trying to make a gasifier for large pieces of wood, about half meter long logs. The project was frozen for a couple of years. The Wood Institute resumed works on the Dekalenkov gasifier in 1930. Its first metal version was unsuccessful, and a year later the famous Pioneer gasifier for Communar and Kletrak tractors appeared. Before 1930 to 1931 there was chaos in the gasifier business. Individual inventors and designers had developed gasifiers amateurishly. In order to unite the scattered artisans and learn about new achievements of enthusiasts, the Aftidor Society decided to organize an all-union competition in 1930 to 1931 for the best gasifier design. This competition gave great impetus to the development of the Soviet gasifier business. Dekalenkov's firewood downdraft gasifier called Pioneer D7 participated in this competition. It was mounted on a Communar 50 tractor in Moscow and launched in Konsevo Midashi 40 km long motor rally. The gasifier worked satisfactorily on the wood with 20-35% moisture content. 
Namov Charcoal Gasifier, Videnski V3 Gasifier, and a collective OKB-8 Gasifier designed by engineers Polyaboyarnov, Fokin, and others for Caterpillar 60 Tractor also participated in the competition. The most simple and reliable firewood gasifier turned out to be Pioneer D7 by Dekalenkov. It was decided to produce it. Kaminar Tractor participated in the Aftador tests in 1932. The tractor transported trolleys with timber along the timber rail road. 17 trolleys contained 100 cubic meters of logs. And already on April 8, 1932, the Special Commission declared the Pioneer gasifier suitable for production. In the same 1932, the D7 gasifier was installed and tested on a Kletrak 40 tractor near Sverdlovsk. It should be mentioned that none of the gasifiers practically worked at the enterprises before 1932. There were just tests, motor rallies, and laboratory measurements. Without waiting for laboratory test results, Dekalenkov already introduced his Pioneer gasifiers at truck and tractor bases in 1932. In fact, they were the first Soviet firewood gasifiers accepted for replication. The Wood Institute undertook extensive activities related to transport gasifiers in 1933. However, the Institute did not conduct deep theoretical research on transport gasifiers. In September 1933, Dekalenkov created the first Pioneer gasifier called D6 for the gas truck. The gasifier was produced by the Wood Institute. After trial tests, the gas truck was transferred to the Carroll's Forest Machine Station in Lososinsk where it worked on timber hauling. Dekalenkov became a Forest Institute employee. He was taken to the Institute for his expertise and experience and organized a bureau for the introduction of gasifiers which he chaired. The Institute produced 50 of his gasifiers, which went to logging. The Bureau for the Introduction of Gasifiers took forest bases under its patronage, it trained gasifier truck drivers. It told people how to create an infrastructure for using gasifier trucks, to prepare and dry fuel, store it, etc. For example, one Stalinets gasifier tractor required 200 cubic meters of dry billets to be harvested in summer. It became necessary to arrange billet storages every 5 kilometers along the tractor's route. The billets had to be dry. The calculation was based on the fact that the tractor gasifier hopper held enough fuel for an hour run, and the tractor passed about 5 kilometers per hour. In France, for example, there were about 1,500 firewood fuel stations for buses and trucks all over the country by about this time. And 90% of the fuel in France was charcoal. The French were not fond of wood smoke in city centers. In the fall of the same year, 1933, Dekalenkov tested the Pioneer D6 gasifier on an international motorboat with a tractor engine on the Neva River in Leningrad. It is safe to say that Dekalenkov put half his life into the introduction of gasifier transport. More than 15 years passed from his first firewood power plant he assembled in 1924 to the beginning of World War II. Unfortunately, his firewood-powered gasifiers didn't work as well as they should. He was blatantly losing motor rallies. A truck on which his gasifier was installed had its pistons jammed by tar during one of the rallies. Dekalenkov started by feeding air into the hearth through the slots. But after the lost motor rally with the worst performance indicators and tar in the engine, he managed to introduce two years. Later, stubbornly not introducing an hourglass shape of the combustion chamber, he applied the German method of air supply to the middle of the firebox. A little later, in 1937, Dekalenkov would remake Imbert's firebox to create his own firebox made of non-chromium heat-resistant cast iron. It would be put into production. But to do this, Dekalenkov had to lose to Imbert gasifier. I'll tell you about that next. Dekalenkov's counterparts took the easiest way at that time. They used charcoal gasifiers, and some of them simply copied Imbert's. And, naturally, copies of the Imbert gasifier showed the lowest tar content and the highest results. After all, Imbert had been refining his invention for 13 years. His gasifiers were being mass-produced by several dozen companies at that time. On the other hand, Dekalenkov stubbornly tried to test his own ideas all the way to the end. In 1936, the gasifiers by young engineer Mezin were tested and then accepted for serial production, while Dekalenkov's gasifiers lost. In the same year, the director of the Automotive Research Institute directly told Dekalenkov that his gasifiers were outdated, they spoiled and tarred engines, so they would no longer be produced. What a blow! But Dekalenkov didn't give up. 
he began to figure out why his gasifiers produced so much more tar. He invented his own firebox but did not blindly copy the combustion chamber. He made it in his own way, better than Imbert. The fact is that Imbert fireboxes were cast from high alloy steel, simply put, stainless steel containing nickel and chromium. They cracked along the neck and at the welding. Dekalenkov made his firebox from cheaper cast iron with a flange mount, which was even better. And the lifespan of his fireboxes now was more than two years, while conventional Western and Soviet fireboxes usually lasted for six months. Here he outdid himself and everyone else. But even though his firebox was better, he made a filtration system again from iron brush instead of copying the Palusa filter. The Automotive Research Institute checked the efficiency of his brush filters and found it to be only 24%. Pins with 15 ring brushes were inserted into four pipes. The test showed that Rashid rings were the most efficient. And Dekalenkov's already modified model showed poor results again. His last works cut short in 1940, before the war. I believe he was killed. A bright figure in the gasifier business was engineer Mezin, quite young at that time. Later he would get a scientific title, but in the meantime, he hung around with the founding fathers of the gasifier business, learned, and watched. Mezin came into the gasifier business around 1931. Some gasifier enthusiasts would not survive the war. As I said above, Dekalenkov's works came to an end in 1940, as did the works of the already aged Professor Namov. Videnski was an active member of the Avtador Society. His magazine articles pour out of the horn of plenty. He angrily denounced those who hindered the advancement of the gasifier business. Videnski, who wrote, in my opinion, the most comprehensible and therefore pleasant book for beginners, Soviet gasifier vehicles, also disappeared. His last books are dated 1940. There was one more talented and persistent gasifier enthusiast who would survive the war, Comrade Peltzer, about whom we will talk next. Yudishkin, who wrote the only Soviet book about gasifier tractors after World War II, would also survive the war. Mezin worked both before and after the war. He did a lot of research and made a very significant contribution to the Soviet gasifier business. Mezin's only misstep, in my opinion, was his book Transport Gasifiers, in which he wrote whatever he pleased, not trying to convey anything to the reader. In this book, he put the principle on which the Imbert gasifier is based into mathematical formulas, and more. It is a serious scientific work, in which Mezin went deeper than other Soviet authors. But in my opinion, this is the only Soviet book on gasifiers that is literally impossible to read. The book summed up the author's 15 years of experience. By the way, this book, published in 1948, was proofread by the gasifier expert, who started in Namov's time, in 1925, now a major general, Professor Karpov. Subsequently, Mezin's apprentice, engineer Tokarev, with whom they started working together even before the war, will write the most comprehensible and popular book, used by many people who start their way in the business of transport gasifiers today. Tokarev would also survive the war. Let's return to the beginning of the young engineer Mezin's career in 1931. Passionate about the idea of a firewood-powered truck, he hung around Avtador society members, he studied gasifiers and looked at Western and Soviet models. Mezin initially approached the development of transport gasifiers scientifically. He was against a rough guess approach to gasifier design, as some engineers of that time used, and insisted on basing on formulas. His works show that he seriously and deeply studied the works of Western scientists and engineers and he created his first gasifier, Avtador II, the forerunner of the Soviet mass-produced gasifier. It had a predecessor, Avtador I. I don't know whether Mezin took part in the development of that device. A team of authors, consisting of Tidov, Polyaboyarinov, Yuvarov, and others, who were members of the Avtador Society are referred to as the creators of the Avtador I gasifier. After the war, Polyaboyarinov will deal with industrial gasifiers. The Avtador I device embodied the youth and inexperience of gasifier knowledge of the Avtador society members. It was assembled amateurishly from what was at hand. This was typical for almost all gasifiers of those times until they went into mass production. But even then there were also a lot of casting defects of steel hearth. The lack of theoretical and practical experience was evident. 
it was the beginning of the gasifier business and the first mistakes. The gasifier had no heating of the hopper and air. Threaded steel tweers were simply screwed into the gasifier body, passing through the brickwork. The combustion intensity was estimated as for well-burned charcoal, 300 kilograms per square meter. The gasification chamber had a cylindrical shape, which resulted in enormous amounts of water and tar. The creators proceeded from the example of Dekalenkov, who also made cylindrical cast iron chambers with slots. The first versions of such chambers would later burn out after a few hundred hours of operation and be completely lost in all motor rallies. Although the gasifier was tested in 1935 and 1936, when Imbert had already made an unattainable peak for many designers, a sandglass-shaped downdraft gasifier, the Aftador designers didn't understand the principles on which it was based. They tried to copy Imbert's gas purification system, but used only battery purifiers, and compensated for the absence of rashid rings by wire stuffing. They took the example of Dekalenkov, who also made purifiers with wire ruffs. But they decided to do their gasifier in their own way. The designers most likely made it in this way because there was not possible to cast metal fireboxes and everything was done amateurishly by hand, as simply as possible. Of course, this gasifier was no good at all. Like many of today's ardent garage enthusiasts, it was not a gas but a tar generator. No filter could cope with so much tar, and the gasifier had to work on billets of 15% moisture. But after the mistakes have been corrected, the Aftador 2 gasifier appeared. Young engineer Mezin was clearly indicated as its chief designer. This gasifier was made on the basis of the Imbert Dietrich gasifier he studied in 1928 to 1929. That's how the Imbert gasifier was called in those years. Imbert would later be left alone, having quarreled with Dietrich, who filed patents for himself, although Imbert was also involved in the development. After studying that gasifier, Mezin and his colleagues from the Aftador Society Druyen and Peltzer created, in fact, a copy of the Imbert gasifier. No rashid rings were available, so the inventors took iron hair for the fine filter because it was cheaper. No Pelusa filters were available, too, so they just used refrigerator tubes. Mezin decided to simplify everything. Aftador 2 gasifier participated in the 1934 Moscow-Leningrad-Moscow motor rally, where it showed the best performance. It was predictable for the copy of the Imbert device even without hopper heating and Palooza filters. It was this kind of gasifier that became recommended for serial production. Here it should be noted that it was Mezin who proposed his downdraft gasifier thermal calculation in 1931 after studying Western devices. Thus, he put processes that take place inside the combustion chamber into mathematical formulas. The inventor studied tuyere shapes and their influence on gasification. In 1934, before creating his copy of the Imbert gasifier, Mezin co-authored a book entitled Lightweight Vehicle and Tractor Type Gasifiers. After reading the book, one can see that Mezin has delved deeply into the subject and has done a tremendous amount of analytical work. Another author of the book is Chernal Mordic, a talented engineer, who has written a good book on transport gasifiers. The third author is Sergei Sadov. Sadov was his mother's last name. This man was none other than the youngest son of Lev Trotsky, the father of the October Revolution. Sergei shied away from his father's glory and wanted to achieve everything himself. And he did. He became a Soviet scientist, a heating engineer, and a professor. He kept away from politics and was a non-party man. He graduated from the Moscow Mechanics Institute. He taught at the Moscow Aviation Institute and the Airship College. He was the author of a number of works on thermodynamics and diesel engine theory. At the age of 28, he became a professor at the Moscow Institute of Technology and the co-author of a book on gasifiers. He lived in Leningrad. Stalin forcibly deported his father from the USSR after seizing power in 1929. Sergei, considering himself a patriot, wanted to work for the benefit of his homeland and remained in the USSR. As a result, he was arrested and imprisoned in the Buterska prison in connection with the so-called Kremlin case on March 3, 1935. He was sentenced to five years in a penal colony, which was later replaced by five years of exile in Krasnoyarsk. Henrietta Rubinstein, his second wife, followed him into exile. 
Sadov lived in Krasnoyarsk and worked at the Krasnoyarsk machine plant where he was hired as a gasifier engineer. In June 1936 he was accused of sabotage and arrested again, then sent to Vorkuta, then to Moscow for further investigation, after which he was returned to Krasnoyarsk, where he was executed on October 29, 1937. Sadov was distinguished by his forthcoming manner and was a friendly person. I read his book Light Gasifiers. This is the work of a man who deeply understands the subject of gas generation. But back to Mezin. Having gained experience with the Avtador 2 gasifier, Mezin improved it and made the Nadi 10 model for ZIS-5 and Nadi 11 4 gas AA trucks. The two trucks shown in the photo were tested at Zagorsk in 1935. They achieved good results. Only minor general breakdowns caused minor problems, which Mezin later eliminated. These devices were accepted for serial production a year later, in 1936. That was the start of the mass production of transport gasifiers in the USSR. Before 1935, gasifiers were not produced on large scale. The turning point came after the resolution of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of January 19, 1935, which noted the need for widespread use of gasifier vehicles and tractors and logging. The decree of March 11, 1936, vested gasifiers production to several plants, while ZIS, GAS, and CHTZ truck plants were obliged to equip their trucks and tractors with these gasifiers. In Kharkov, the Svet Shaktara plant, which made horse-drawn carriages for miners, began making gasifiers to be mounted on GAS and ZIS trucks. These gasifiers were produced on an assembly line. An assemble-it-yourself equipment kit and booklet about vehicle refitting was delivered to truck depots. After studying the inputs, depot workers had to refit the trucks. Of course, they defended themselves against such kind of work as best as they could, refusing to do it. You had to learn how to start and drive such a truck. You had to read information updates all the time. If you were not keen on this and it wasn't your money you were saving, who needed all this hustle? It was much easier to fill a tank with gasoline. Up until about the late 1950s, not counting the war, I guess, the planned economy forced the transfer to gasifier transport, while the local workers, who were enforced to use these vehicles, shirked in every way possible just to avoid using such transport. So, the problem was not solved. In Europe, conveyorized production plants produced trucks and tractors with already installed gasifiers. In the Soviet Union, people had to install all this half-ton cumbersome equipment by themselves. Later, of course, trucks and tractors would be produced with already installed gasifiers in the USSR, too. In 1936, Mezin moved away from copying the hearth and tried to design his own. Consequently, the model showed worse results. Around the same time, the Automotive Research Institute made an absolute copy of the Imbert gasifier under the leadership of Comrade Kossoff. The firebox, bunker heating, as well as coarse and fine filters were copied. Naturally, this device won motor rallies in all respects, the amount of tar, fuel consumption, gas caloric content, etc. And this version also known as Nadi G14 was launched in serial production for one and a half ton trucks. The end of the five-year period was approaching, and industrialization was in full swing, there was absolutely no time for analysis and experiments. Not to mention the fact that the gasifier business had started abroad at least 100 years ago. In fact, there were only a few people in the Soviet Union who were trying to assemble firewood, not charcoal, gasifiers under makeshift conditions and without funding. Soviet self-trained specialists from the Avtador Society Dekalenkov, Videnski, and Mezin had begun studying this subject only a few years ago. And now we are still talking about firewood, not charcoal, gasifiers. Videnski also tried to make gasifiers under the V brand. He even made a monorder, which discharged moisture from the fuel, in a hopper heater. But the cylindrical hearth undermined all the efforts completely. Naturally, it produced too much tar. But this was not all that Soviet gasifiers thought had to offer. Let me remind you that in 1923, European customers had a choice of 25 types of gasifiers. That's how far behind the Soviet Union was. Next, I will tell you about devices and discoveries which had no analogs in the West. The flywheel of Soviet science needed time to spin. In the meantime, all Soviet engineers could do was translate Western articles and copy the devices they had brought with them. 
the five-year plans after 1939 envisaged the production of 18,000 gasifier trucks and 10,000 gasifier tractors. Chairman of the Council of People's Commissars Molotov announced this at the 8th Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. All vehicles at logging sites were to be only gasifier ones. The mass of trucks, riverboats, railroad transport, and tractors in the collective farms was also supposed to run on firewood. The scope was titanic. In 1942, the plan envisaged the production of 1,700,000 vehicles. Two million drivers had to be trained in advance. Most of the trucks had to run on firewood. Just in 1939, the Finnish war broke out, which involved 100,000 vehicles that consumed tons of liquid fuel. In the same year, the USSR took first place in Europe in the production of powerful track tractors and trucks. The shortage of liquid fuel was catastrophic. The gasifier business was blooming in the eyes. In 1945, a month before the war ended, Mezin published an analytical work on how the combustion chamber shape affected gasifier operation. As we see, he did not sit idly by during the war. Later, in his book Mezin wrote that there had been no serious book describing the principles of firebox operation and formulas. So, Mezin filled this gap by experimenting with the variable active zone hearth. Another year later, in 1946, a breakthrough study of a new type of filter with rashid rings came out from under his pen. The fact is that one way or another, the rashid ring filter is the most effective for transport gasifiers. But Mezin managed to improve even it. The weakness of the rashid ring filter is dry gas. And the drier it is, the worse the filter performs. Water, enveloping the rings, serves as a trap for micron ash particles that affect the engine. Mezin invented to combine the bubbler with the old filter. In 1946, he developed and theoretically substantiated it. The filter was tested a little later and proved to be very effective. It would be implemented in the last generation of unparalleled transport gasifiers. Now Soviet scientists no longer had to blindly copy imported developments, they understood the principles of gasifier operation. Plus, the terrible war was over, and now it was possible to take care of gasifiers without a rush. Imbert filtration system, the ancient Palooza Owen filter that purified gas from tar was introduced by ancient metallurgists and was 100 years old at the moment, was no longer needed. The Americans extorted the factory from Imbert in 1944, and he would never return to the gasifier business again. Imbert was no longer the flagship. Soviet scientists became took the lead. A distinctive feature of gas filtration in Soviet gasifiers was a cyclone, not an ordinary one, but of a special shape. This form of cyclone won as a result of many tests. It gave the best efficiency. The cooler and bubbler were combined with rashid rings. Besides, the inventors finally made a maintainable gasifier that could run on various types of fuel. Not only dry, but also wet, up to 100% moisture, chocks, as well as peat briquettes could be used as fuel. Earlier it was almost impossible to use the last two types of fuel. It was the pinnacle of the gasifier business. Even Imbert, the father of transport gasifiers, could not reach such results. He dropped out of the race along with Germany, which had lost the war. No one could make a mass-produced gasifier that could run on different types of fuel, including wet, before. Soviet scientists made a masterpiece of gasifier thought, standing on the shoulders of the dead titan and seeing new horizons just at that time, in 1950, when Imbert drank himself to death. So many years of catching up and copying, but finally making their own. I will certainly tell you about this gasifier in detail in the next parts. But I don't want to break the chronology of events for now. We will go back in time and talk about the world champion among car gasifiers, Comrade Peltzer's fantastic gasifier mystically appealing to his successors.